Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge podcast. So uh, for today, I figured um, I'd answer a request uh, from somebody on Reddit that I thought was very interesting. Uh, Wilmer Street 123 was asking about how do intensive care teams in hospital take into consideration various religious and cultural beliefs when you're guiding patients' decisions? Uh, while uh, I believe this to be an important aspect of care, especially in areas like uh, limiting life support, palliation, I often wonder if hospitals today consider this a practical step, considering uh, there can be more or there can be so many individual beliefs to navigate in the first place. Would love to hear your thoughts. So uh, thanks for letting me do this episode. Uh, I actually um, asked if, if I could because I thought it was a topic that I certainly was never taught in school. At least it wasn't taught in that manner. Uh, how to provide uh, spiritual support or what you would call mental support or what you would call surrogate decision-making tools or what you would call even breaking bad news. They were taught in fragmented ways at different levels. And if you look at any medical school, even postgraduate curriculum, even CANMED's rules and things like that, breaking bad news, uh, surrogate consent, family updates, communication skills, spiritual care, all of these things are all taught in a very fragmented way. And I think that there's multiple reasons for it, and I'll go into some of them, but I think we're not particularly good at addressing this concern from the ground up within our healthcare system, neither in nursing nor in medical school. And part of the bias is probably to do with the fact that in many cases, it's linked with very strong cultural and religious underpinnings that we may not have in common. And so uh, it becomes more difficult uh, for the application of, of these skills in a way that, that would respect people's culture and religious point of view. And so I, I think that the best way to put it is uh, today we're going to be talking about psychosocial outcomes uh, in the ICU patients' families. And we're going to touch on all of these things under that blanket term, because effectively that's the blanket term. And when I tried to research the topic, one of the first things that happened was I found out that I'm very bad at it, so that, that I could be doing a better job, and certainly we could all be doing a better job at it. Um, you know, why is it important? So it's important because this is what you're doing uh, when you take somebody to the ICU. First, you limit their ability to communicate with the outside world and with you, because by and large, we intubate a lot of people in the ICU. And even if we don't intubate them, we put barriers between us and them, including putting them in a bed, uh, having us stare at them and stare at their vitals, things like this, that will be a source of anxiety and stress for them and for their families. And we also put them in a position where we're going to be making lots of very quick, quick fire, rapid decisions in succession. And these aren't going to be small decisions. These are going to be major decisions and will have major rec recognizable, sometimes life-altering implications for them and for their relationship with the people around them. And we as doctors, nurses, uh, spiritual support teams working in hospitals, um, even mental health experts, I don't think despite our, our extreme levels of expertise, I don't think that we recognize what our role is in their lives. It's a very confusing role for patients and families. You're the person who has produced a lot of the stress for them on this particular day that you've decided to speak to them. And at the same time, you're the person who is forcing them or trying to make them make some decisions that they may not be comfortable making or that's the way that they interpret it, at least. I know that none of us force our patients into anything. Uh, it's not something that's very appropriate. And you can't give them a known outcome because this is an ICU patient. As we know, in ICU patients, prognosis doesn't count for anything. Our business is poor prognosis and our business is unpredictable. You know, I, I've, I maintain that uh, always. And you, you really, with that in mind, you have such a narrow, small infinitesimally small window every now and then to open up opportunities to gain the trust of the family and to gain the trust of the patient where it's available. Personally, I talk to patients uh, during their sedation windows and I give them updates whenever I can. 
sometimes I don't have enough time, the nurses are doing a good job of it in our unit too. And, you know, I think it's very hard to research this topic and to figure out how to deal with this issue for multiple reasons. But the one that's the most annoying, although easily explainable, is, you know, something that looks like this, where we define um, the roles of spiritual care, the activities, such as uh, being a companion, being a counselor, having the difficult conversation, supporting the difficult conversation, addressing individual needs in a, in a customized behavioral fashion, providing family support, clinician support, and bridging the gap between the family and the clinician, providing a holistic perspective, and establishing foundational principles of resilience. You know, you, you would think that this would be in an ICU book or in a guideline uh, from the ICU or from I some ICU journal. It actually is not. And just by the word tensions in the middle, you can tell that, that it was not probably written with somebody with an extreme, extreme clinical background. This is from the Journal of Health Care Chaplaincy. I'll be honest with you, I'm not Christian. And so therefore, had I not went to actively research this topic and, and you know, spent a couple of hours looking things up and talking to people and emailing people and things like this, I probably would not have stumbled upon this paper, which is a pretty good paper, I have to say. So I, I think that that's one of the reasons. It's that me not being a, a Christian, I would never, or I, I would find it very hard to uh, look these things up or read or keep up to date with the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy. It's just not something that, that I would personally do. Why is that a problem? Because there are other religious uh, and spiritual and uh, socially uh, supportive uh, publications that may not follow the media that we follow as clinical practitioners. So, you know, it's, it's very hard for, for us to find good data because there are other ways for that data to be distributed and we just don't use it. One of the things is uh, healthcare counselors or, or social counselors or social support teams that do community social work, that do social activism, have a significant amount of content on YouTube. And it's, it's better than anything that I've read in any uh, sort of uh, evidence-based paper. And I think that part of the reason is because, you know, we as physicians weren't taught that this was our priority. We were just never told this is going to be something that you're going to have to be good at. We were always told that it would be something that, that we would learn as Breaking Bad News as an intern or something. But we were never told that it was something that we had to be good at. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're traditionally bad at it. There are certain cultures where it's just extremely sensitive. You know, people don't necessarily accept the discussions, the difficult discussions. And, you know, the question becomes, is there any way to be good at it? Is there any particular way? For, for us to be really, really good at it? Is there any metric that we should be following? And, and who should be doing it? Should there be a, a spiritual support officer uh, who who's an expert at recognizing certain values? Should there be a specific dedicated uh, family nurse like we have in some of our institutions that we work in? Or should it be, um, you know, dedicated time for training for the attendings uh, that will then translate to courses that we should be taking? And... You know, I think that's that's a very difficult question to answer. I think it depends on the context. In certain cultures, the physicians expected to have the difficult conversation but also be supportive, almost paternalistic. You know, I'm not saying paternalistic as in I'm going to make all the decisions. Paternalistic as in being the, the person in the driver's seat, being the person who's going to be responsible for the good and the bad outcomes, ultimately, who's going to be responsible for, for supporting them through the journey. In other cultures, they're extremely secular, and, and there are clearly defined roles for the physicians. And oftentimes, there's an acceptance that the physician is going to be a, a dry, clear-cut person and just will not provide that holistic support and oftentimes the family unit itself provides that holistic support in that sense and so you know it's very hard for us to have a clear-cut guideline but there are some out there some stuff I agree with some stuff not so much we'll talk about it and like I said fragmented publications looking at different goals 
and it's just become a fragmented problem where in different places different people are doing different things and I think that that's part of the reason why it's so difficult and so hard to answer but ultimately a good place to start to address this problem is the family meeting family meeting is by far the most important in my opinion cornerstone for establishing the rapport that you need to guide these families through an extremely difficult journey no matter uh, what your belief system is as a physician or as a nurse or as a doctor or where you're working I've worked in multiple places with multiple cultures and even if people do have biases against me for the way I speak or the way I look or my last name at the end of the day having a strong well-structured healthy family meeting produces a healthy rapport with your patient regardless and you know this is a good place to start there are other uh, spiritual care toolkits and uh, other methods of evaluating the humanism within your ICU and some of the challenges that, that have been found to be evidence-based using multiple mixed method studies are you know an inability to provide uh, true accountability an inability to provide uh, routine care and ability to provide it uh, as part of, of a routine paradigm and so these mixed method studies I'm not going to dwell on because it's not it's not easy to do and it's not easy to implement as you can see but there are some non-evidence-based uh, uh, practical uh, things that you can do that are advocated for multiple guidelines which I'll mention later First thing is introduce yourself in the team. Get the family to recognize that it's not just one person who's going to guide them through the journey. It's going to be a whole team. And, and tell them right off the bat that it's going to be, you're going to be covering the call for the next week or the next two weeks or the next three weeks. Make it clear who's available and for how long. So make it clear when you can talk to them and for how long you can talk to them. Allow them to voice their concerns openly. Give them the time to speak. Whenever you answer, answer with supporting information. So refer to the x-ray, refer to the EKG, refer to the blood tests. You're not overloading them with information, but you're telling them that the information that they're getting is valid for this reason. Offer the support of various different parts of your team in your hospital. Make sure that you remind them that there is a spiritual care expert. Um, if, if you're in a mainly, um, you know, specific cultural concern there are community outreach places there are social workers that can help it does not necessarily have to be linked with a particular religious belief make sure that they understand that there's going to be social workers available that there's going to be other foundational links available that the hospital is not just there to provide a ventilator or TPN that the hospital is there to guide them through a journey and remind them of anything that they might forget. So they might forget to fill in insurance forms. They might forget to ask for a letter for work for their patient. They might forget all of these things because this is the worst day of their life. And your job as the person conducting this meeting, and I don't care, like I said, if it's the physician, if it's the nurse, if it's the physician's assistant, in different institutions, I've had it being conducted by different people. In one institution, we had a, a family a nurse practitioner who was simply phenomenal. Like, I would be embarrassed to even attempt to communicate if she was in the room. And she knew the patient so well because she rounded with us. She learned off those files right off the bat, like off by heart. And, you know, it depends. I don't care who does it. But whenever you do something like this, it has to be done with the confidence and the outright objective of establishing enough of a rapport between you and the family for them to trust you for the days to come and the difficulties to come and it has to be addressing all of their concerns you, you can't let a family member leave feeling that there's a concern that you haven't addressed it doesn't mean that you're going to tell them that everything's going to be fine that's the opposite of what you should say but they should know why things aren't fine nobody in the ICU is ever fine or going to be fine guaranteed. It's extremely rare, right? They need to know why. They need to walk out of there with the clues in place. They need to know walk out of there with the tools in place. They need to have the confidence that all the paperwork that they're going to need is going to be taken care of one way or another. That there is a social worker available. And lastly, after your first first to face face to face meeting, 
I offer families two options. Either that I'll meet them during their visiting hours in a particular time where I make sure that I am available or I do it over the phone with a daily update and they get to choose. Some families simply cannot logistically come in if they live in a far town, etc. And you know, it's, it's very similar to the first diagram I showed you. These things are extremely important because there's a lot of cognitive processing that patients' family members go through. And the contributing factors include surrogate factors that you probably aren't directly um, involved in, things like socio-demographics, a level of healthcare literacy, their primary language, the culture that they come from, their spirituality and belief systems, like we talked about, any previous knowledge that they may have about the patient's illness. If the patient's told them that you know their cancer is cured, and or they're in remission, and it's a lie, but it's the patient's right to say that, and now they've deteriorated, then you're going to have to address that concern. That adds to the cognitive load. Their social support structure. If they have any psychiatric illnesses, if they have the ability to cope, do they have other stressors, financial and otherwise? And how can they process information? This is stuff that we need to get out of the family members and get a good idea of. It's very, very hard to do. I'm still learning how to do it. I'm becoming better at it more, more every day. But I really do think that it's one of those things where we're just not good enough as healthcare practitioners, certainly as physicians. And, you know, I'm not just saying this because of my surgical background, but certainly as physicians, we're not great at it. So we need to be much better at that. We need to understand the social demographic context, how much the patient's family already knows in terms of both the individual's health, the patient's health, and healthcare knowledge overall. Their primary language and culture, how does that culture fit in? How does that culture mourn? How does that culture process things? Because every culture is different. I've worked in a whole bunch of different places and things are different everywhere. Look at their psychiatric illness background. Look at the coping mechanisms and support structures that they have and uh, identify any personal or family experiences that they've had previously with critical care. Many families come in with their biases because of the fact that they've had previous experiences that were bad with critical care. An example could be never ventilate a COVID patient because ventilators are associated with poor outcomes. That's been all over Reddit. It's been all over the news. And that's not the reality. And we know it now, right? Then you need to identify the patient and when they last saw the patient. So uh, is it something where the patient has been prognostically poor and has been non-functional? Or is it something where the patient has had a substance abuse situation or self-harm situation? Or is it something where the patient themselves were hurt by somebody, either deliberately or otherwise? That also builds into the cognitive load and the stress that the families go through, right? Next, there's the relationships. How emotionally complicated is that family member's relationship with the patient themselves? How much of a strain is it for them, right? And the interfamily dynamics. Lastly, there's the healthcare system problem. So past negative or positive communications with other members of staff that you work with. We've all had problems where we communicate with patients in a way that does not seem to be okay for them. We've all had that. We all have what, what uh, I would refer to as difficult family situations, right? We need to try and address those and, and not make those part of the stress problem, okay? Then if they've had any previous medical errors, is the patient in the ICU because of something that might be interpreted as a complication or medical error? And experiences with other facilities, better or worse, relatively speaking. Once you put these things into context, your family conference or your family meeting should be able to have some direction, okay? And that direction will eventually lead you to a shared decision-making paradigm throughout this journey that the patient's going to be on. I use the word should because it's very important that we understand that it's a sliding scale. It may work, it may not work. It's not an exact science because there are so many contributing factors. And like I said, we're very poorly trained at it. So. I would say that from the outset, you should value all the family's statements and concerns. You should acknowledge the family's emotions, and you should listen to them in order to ascertain which of these stressors are affecting them. Understand 
that the patient is a person and make sure that they understand that too, that you have a strong understanding of the patient's background and why they're there and all of these things. And then elicit family questions. You should use these tools when communicating to allow you to explain and assess the patient's prognosis and how certain you are. And we're never that certain. We all know this. Let's be honest. Okay. How much the family wants to know and how much the family would like to be involved as surrogate decision makers in terms of the knowledge base problem and the emotional constraint problem and adapt your communication and use the correct tools be it spiritual care tools and people who are experts at that mental health and support tools or social worker support tools to address the concerns to reduce the cognitive load and allow for a significant amount of autonomy in the shared decision making process it's extremely important that things go through in that manner and you know it's a multi-dimensional problem with multiple examples that you'll see in the literature so one of them is providing the medical information and asking about the patient's values it's extremely difficult to do when I'm wearing my surgeon's hat we don't do it that much but as an intensivist I will often ask what do you think the patient would have wanted after I go through the pros and cons the acceptable alternatives the nature of the decision involved the risks and the benefits your whole consent spiel I then go into the uncertainty of what's going to happen, assess their understanding of it, and then I ask them about the patient's own values and preferences. And that helps them out a lot because they understand that now you're not, you're not making them make the decision. You're making them use their knowledge of the patient as a human being to make a decision that that patient would have made anyway. And you also need to explore the the family's role in the decision-making process in general, right? So would they want a best friend's input, a life partner's input? Would they want input from another expert that they know in the family or the family knows, like the family doctor? Is it something that we can facilitate? And you need to address those things too. And then you need to allow for some deliberation and some discussion where appropriate. Sometimes it's just not appropriate. Sometimes it's an emergency decision, but where appropriate, there should be a very, 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 very articulated discussion among the family members, with you there to support them or otherwise. It's, again, their preference, not yours or mine. And that's how I address these difficult conversations, these extremely, extremely dynamic and difficult conversations. And, you know, I think it's also important to understand that within this context of, of this type of of of, of um, psychosocial health um, process it's it's important to understand the culture so in, in Kuwait for example now we have a lot of uh, COVID patients uh, coronavirus positive patients etc and we we've had a very strong culture where tracheostomies are seen as as a very negative thing and the ability of somebody to speak or communicate is, is highly valued uh, even if it's only for a temporary amount of time, it's still highly valued. And there are so many rumors about nightmares with tracheostomies. And, you know, I, I sort of start introducing the idea very early on if I think it's appropriate. If the patient has a relatively good prognosis and they would benefit from it in terms of a weaning strategy, I address it very early on. And I let them think about the idea over and over. And I discuss it with them over and over again. And I explain to them that it's something that we need to look at. It's something that's still on the table. And I find that that helps them through that journey a lot. And, and it really does help. Uh, a couple of things to increase the quality of care in general, um, decrease psychological symptoms and improve rates of communication is to conduct a family conference within 72 hours, do it in a private place, uh, provide consistent communication with you or surrogate team members, uh, listen to them before you speak so you get the information on the dynamics that you need to guide them through. Make empathetic statements. Make surrogate decision-making statements and identify the common missed opportunities. So identify those narrow windows where things could have gone differently. And assure them that you will take care of the patient and assure them that you're available for them. Provide explicit support and explain to them that it's a difficult decision that has to be made and we're going through difficult times, but we have to get through it. 
lastly, I would thoroughly recommend that everybody, everybody documents, not for billing, but for legal aspects. So a lot of the uh, legal issues that tend to come up in the ICU are because there is no documentation. And I think that's extremely important. So first, you need to document why the family is giving consent for whatever you want to do. Second, you need to document that there was a discussion. Third, you need to document that during the discussion, the concerns were raised and the decisions were made based on the concerns being addressed. Okay. In conclusion, it's all about guiding them through the process. Sorry about the typo. Lots of typos. It's essentially about that, right? The ICU is a journey. We know this. Having worked in ICUs for a while, many of you listening to this or have been exposed to it during your training, many of you understand how, how much of what being in an ICU is a journey, and it's a difficult journey. They're climbing Everest, and you, you're like their Sherpa. You're trying to guide them through. And like any Sherpa, you need to invest in the relationship, right? It, it needs to be a relationship where you know your limitations as a healthcare practitioner and elicit the right psychosocial experts, the right mental health experts, the right spiritual care experts, with an ultimate respect for the patient's own beliefs, and obviously not allowing yours to be a barrier towards the patient's uh, outcomes or towards the family getting closure if the outcomes aren't what you had hoped for, what the family had hoped for. This is Saud Al-Zaid. Uh, thank you for listening. And please like, comment, sub and subscribe. And please let me know if you want more interesting topics. This was actually, I enjoyed reading about it, and it certainly did add to my practice.